Can we start, ma'am? Good afternoon, ma'am. Sorry for the delay, madam. No issues. Can we start? Yes. Okay, I'll start immediately because already it's very late. Okay. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. So just give me a few seconds, sir, and I'll just put my PPT. Mm -hmm. Take care of it. Don't Okay, so we start today. Uh, today uh, session, I thought I will be taking on the case studies, you know, the practical application of a uh, few emerging technologies, basically uh, the courses like uh, AI, artificial intelligence, IoT, and uh, the cloud computing concept. And we will take and we we'll look at some case studies. Uh, we will see the application, real-time applications in terms of how these are used and uh, some very typical cases uh, that how these machine learning uh, the domain subdomain of ai is used in by the companies and what are the various kinds of use uh, so let's start so uh, we will be first taking the ai as in concept and see that how what are the practical application of ai okay so let's start with one thing so uh, before starting, if you remember students, we had one discussion where I said that, uh, you know, uh, however we make a computer intelligent, uh, but uh, will the computer have the capability or the mental capability of uh, deceiving a human being uh, and uh, or surpassing the human intelligence, the natural intelligence we will say. So Alan Turing, if you remember, I told you about Turing test that how we can uh, do a Turing test. Alan Turing was a uh, computer scientist who basically came up first time with the word AI and he said that uh, the, uh, the Turing test is done basically to understand or to test a computer intelligent skills. So he also said that a computer would deserve to be called intelligent if it would deceive a human into believing that it was human. So till now, hardly any computer except for few have passed this Turing test uh, which could deceive a human being and a human being can tell that no this is not a computer this is human being so uh, let's look into some of the cases so one of the case study which i found interesting was can artificial intelligence actually help us in protecting the endangered uh, wildlife uh, especially in the region like africa where you have a huge population of wildlife surviving and the entire world is actually making huge effort to uh, make sure that these endangered animals are protected, including India. So how AI can help in that? So how can we use AI to recreate a kind of animal tracking and find out how many endangered animals are uh, basically left in a particular forest, especially this case study is on one of the company who has developed a machine learning algorithm uh, using AI where they could uh, track the 
uh, you know, the number of uh, endangered animals, especially tigers, and find out that how many have left. Uh, so, and very interesting part is that they found out that in a particular big forest where you manually you can't count because the, these kinds of animals are not out and you can't count them by numbers. So how do you find out that how many number of, uh, let's say, cheetah or maybe the tigers are present in a one particular forest area? So the answer lies in the footprint. The footprint, identifying from the footprint and classifying which animal footprint it is, not only this, there are some indigenous uh, animal trackers. These are the people who are the tribal people who live in the forest, who are in and out, who knows in and out of the forest. And looking at the footprint, they can actually tell that which animal footprint it is. Not only this, they can also tell the age of the animal. They can tell whether the animal is the uh, male or female, all those kinds. So uh, a particular company, SAS Vidya, they came up with an AI solution where they could take the expertise of these indigenous animal tracker in the Africa. I'll take you to the site and show you and uh, build the expertise of these trackers, the local people who can tell the number of, uh, you know, animal or they can tell that how many tigers, suppose, are there in one particular forest area and whether how many males are there and female are there. So it's like animal tracking. So uh, not only this, they can have also given the answer like where are from the footprint that where are these animals going? How many are left? Uh, is there much to be learned from uh, the monitoring footprint of endangered species like cheetah and all? So that is what it is. So I'll just take you to the site now. Just give me a few seconds. So students, I'm going to take you to the site and from the site, we are going to learn how a particular company uh, used AI. Just a minute, I'll open the site. Okay. So you can see that they see the site. So this is a company, SAS, SAS uh, company, and uh, this is a, U a US based company. And uh, they basically tried, they did a project in Africa where they uh, had a project to use ML, ML the machine learning, uh, to uh, understand the number of animal left, number of endangered animal left to help the government in protecting this animal from extinction. So I'm going to show you a video. And after that, we, I will tell you how the technology can be used in this. My name, name is Lisa. I like living in Namibia because Namibia is beautiful. There are all the animals and plants. There are some people who want to kill animals like the lions and cheetahs. I like to teach them there are not many left. <laughs> A hundred years ago, we had somewhere in the region of 100,000 cheetahs in the world. Today, the number stands at just 7,100. And these are flagship species. As they disappear, they represent the disappearance of a huge chunk of the biodiversity that goes with them. Biodiversity is what supports all the things that we need as humans, and yet it's disappearing much faster than any of us realize. One way that we've started approaching monitoring of endangered species is to look at their footprints. Yeah, look, I think we've got something here. 
That's cheating, definitely. We've learned from working with indigenous trackers over many years in Africa that. So if you can see, these are the indigenous trackers. Who are these people? These are the people who are the local. Uh, they are the people who know the, you know, the forest in and out. And uh, they have not learned in any school or colleges and obtain any degree. But through their experience, We can... So uh, these people are the people who are uh, who have an expertise just to look at the footprint and tell that how many whose, whose footprint is this is this male or female and how many are left. So uh, let's see how these expertise see uh, AI one of the major characteristic of AI AI can't work on any uh, you know just like uh, in the year it need two ingredients one is the expertise knowledge which is called expert uh, knowledge domain. And the second one, very important, is data. So let's see how it works. Use footprints to identify species, age class, individuals, and sex. Do you have any any thoughts about whether it's male or female? What do you think? It's not so big. Right. If it's a female. Right. So it's interesting that our algorithm is picking up some of the things that you're doing in your yeah. mind, right? We came up with a mathematical model, and this is where SAS comes in, starting with importing images, and then we use those to derive the metrics, which then allows us to do the analysis. We're depending on data and analytics to protect these animals. And now we're beginning crowdsourcing from around the world. So ordinary people who wouldn't necessarily be able to dart a rhino, but they can take an image of a footprint. We've got data coming in from everywhere, too many data for us to manage traditionally. And that's really where artificial intelligence comes in. The big question is, can artificial intelligence do what indigenous tracts can do? When we... So here, if you see till this portion, that how they are trying to build using AI the expertise knowledge of the indigenous trackers who can identify the animal from the footprint and also many other characteristics of the animals. And also they did a part of crowdsourcing of all the images. If you remember the last session, I had uh, AI with no code. In that, I have shown you that uh, more data you have, especially the image data uh, or any kind of a data, accu more accurate is the result. So they started crowdsourcing a lot of images of these footprints of a specific animal like cheetah or the tiger from the various part of the Africa or various other part of the jung, uh, you know, country. And this footprint, along with the knowledge of the expertise knowledge of the indigenous, indigenous tracker, they build a mach algorithm to identify from the footprint image that how which animal footprint is this, what is the sex and the, what is the gender, sorry, and what is the, uh, you know, uh, the number of uh, animals uh, left. See an indigenous tracker look at a footprint. We realize there's a huge gulf between that and what machine intelligence is currently able to do. It's just millions of years of evolution that's allowed us to be able to identify these patterns. And it's a big challenge right. in image processing. Yeah. You know, identifying footprints is a very tedious process to be able to sort and classify them. So to be able to take them that one task that's a repetitive task and automate it seemed like a natural fit for an AI solution. And it required a lot of expertise and insight from Zoe and Sky to help us train the computer to categorize the footprints the same way a human tracker would. So essentially what the heat map is attempting to do is to pick up those edges. This heat map is kind of visualizing what our deep learning model is looking at and just thinking that part of images is important to distinguish it's a cheetah print or a tiger print. The red section is the bit that's actually standing out as representing the footprint. Yeah, like because we are predicting the footprint. So we overlay. Getting 100% accuracy in this project is very challenging, but we'll get there. For this one, we need more data. We need more scientists to contribute to this project so that we can really solve this problem. I'm excited about the potential of artificial intelligence because I think that one of the hugest challenges we face is how to protect our planet, our ecosystem. And the way that we can solve this is by bringing in data from all parts of the world in a hugely magnified scale, much, much more than we have at the present.
these data have incredible value in conservation. If we don't know where the animals are and how many there are, we can't begin to do things like working out where animals should be protected, looking at animal-human conflict. These are all global conservation questions that conservation biologists all over the world need answers to. I think we exist in a world today trying to use artificial intelligence. And our challenge is how to harness this in order to answer some of the most fundamental questions and create an environment where there's room for us and all the rest of the species in this world. Okay, so uh, now students, you have seen that how uh, in this video that how these footprints actually uh, were captured and how the database of uh, the footprint of various animals, especially the endangered animals like tiger and cheetah were uh, crowdsourced and how these images along with the expertise knowledge of the, uh, you know, the indigenous tracker in Africa they could help not only in understanding how many animals uh, of a particular type, let's say cheetah or tiger are there, they are also able to track them and also able to protect them from poaching and also from, uh, you know, dying because of the health disease and all. So this is what the footprint had told them that where are these from the footprint they can identify, uh, the AI algorithm can identify that where are these people going, how many are left out of these endangered animal and all those kinds. So they can track and they can help. So AI may is helping to recreate something, uh, the same kind of a skill, which is actually used by indigenous trackers who uh, are the African local people in the uh, forest. So the Wild Track, this company basically belongs to a parent company called Wild, uh, no, sorry. This company is a SaaS company, but they have one of the branches where they had wild track researchers who are exploring that how AI can be used for conserving these people or conserving something which is which is uh, getting lost. So the solution is something where they are using deep learning, they are using data modeling, uh, and uh, they are trying to build human-like uh, expertise of these indigenous tracker. Uh, they are trying to collect all the footprint images and uh, recognize the pattern in those uh, just like the indigenous trackers are doing and uh, they're trying to do it in a larger scale. Uh, so this uh, wild tracker researchers are actually doing that. So you can see that how this wild tracker footprint identification technique, which is called FIT, uh, it's a tool for non-invasive monitoring uh, and uh, of endangered, endangered uh, species through the digital image of the footprint. Uh, measurement of these images, customizing the mathematical model to understand how many are left, where are they, how to, you know, uh, locate their habitat, how to protect them uh, from any kind of, uh, you know, danger. So that's how the uh, these AI research are helping to give cheetah fight uh, fighting chance. So if you can see certain statistics, they have put it on their side. The cheetah population has seen a 93% decline over the past century. Cheetahs no longer found in 76% of their former habitat throughout Africa, which is one of uh, which has the max, uh, the biggest forest reserve. And cheetah rarely prey on domestic animal, yet many are killed based on assumption. So what happens in even in India also? It has uh, the cheetahs are basically losing life, or they are extinct because of the uh, local people or the villages who are on the border of these forests. And if they see cheetah, they feel that they are going to come and kill them or maybe killing their livestock. And that's the reason why these uh, cheetahs are killed. Uh, so cheetahs cubs are also smuggled because uh, for uh, this thing. So there's a huge poaching which is happening. So they collected all these data of the image of these footprints through crowdsourcing, uh, which had uh, given them huge hope because there are a lot of... Uh, a wild track a journalist or wild track photographers, uh, you know, who has come ahead and helped them in getting those kinds of, uh, you know, images. And these images were used uh, with the mathematical or AI model 
and this AI model could actually perform the task of, uh, you know, helping everything. So this is how it is there. So there is a thing like even you can go and upload any photograph, which is the meaning of the cloud sourcing. So they're harnessing the power of that artificial intelligence to, uh, you know, uh, have uh, the uh, protecting these endangered animals. So this is one of the best cases. Uh, you can just go to this website. It's called SAS. Uh, and uh, you can just uh, try to get uh, more reading on this. I just told you the little bit, see we, if you go here and we see what is possible with AI, you can find a lot of things they have described. So this is how they have so many things with AI, they are doing it. So I just discussed one of the case, you know, uh, I will be discussing about natural language processing also, uh, which basically help in uh, processing images or text or something like that. So there are a lot of cases uh, on these sites, which are the big companies on computer visions. There are clients are Honda and so many company. You can also go ahead onto this side and see and learn how Honda is using AI, you know, all those kinds. So this is one example uh, of the AI. Let's go into the other example now. Just give me a few seconds. Okay. So I'll just take the other cases studies, case study of uh, AI, few examples from the company that how they are leveraging the power of AI. Okay, so this we have already done and we have seen how uh, the SAS is using that. Uh, the next uh, case study is about Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola company, you know that they are the world leader. Just give me a few seconds. I'll just close the door of my cabin. I don't want any noise from here. I'm taking a class. This is not a place for possible. Okay, so um, as you all know that the Coca-Cola is basically a company which are basic um, known for uh, the world leader in this, uh, you know, the soft drink. So Coca-Cola is has also invested a lot. It's one of the biggest company in the world with uh, the huge revenue coming in. This is a company which has also used the AI technology to come up with uh, something uh, to meet the customer need. So what uh, there are a few examples of that, what they have done or they have been doing it. So what is what they are doing is they are, they are basically, I'll just move ahead one minute. So Coca-Cola is using like any other company, the two virtual assistants, Apple, Siri, and Google Alexa to interact with the people uh, on the vending machines. Uh, this is one of the Forbes uh, case study, which I'm discussing. So Coca-Cola came out with one product called Cherry Sprite. Uh, and this there is, if you can see in the picture, this is a high-tech vending machine, uh, which uh, basically in 2017, uh, the CEO of the Coca-Cola, James Quincy, he came out with something, a innovative idea. Coca-Cola is known for innovation, which is called self-serving vending machine. Where what they can do is the people at the Coke vending machine can go and mix and match the flavor, any flavor, like Sprite with Miranda or, uh, you know, any kind of a thing and mix and match and create 150 kind of new flavors and beverage. There was a guide also, which is given. So people can just mix and match and try to, uh, they can do that themselves. So there were 40,000 uh, like this vending machine in US, 
which were serving 14 million drink each day. And uh, this is how they came out with a new idea. Then this was not very good because sometimes what happens is Pepsi uh, co started, you know, the competitor company started backlashing them and saying that there's a lot of sugar in that and uh, design your own flavor soda dispensers are very uh, bad for health. And uh, when the customers are doing, they're not being told that if they add certain flavors like raspberry, vanilla, or lemon, or anything like that, what kind of harmful effect it has if you mix. So all those kinds of things started coming into the media. So what Coca-Cola did, eight years after introducing this kind of self-vending machine for mix and matching and coming up with a new drink, they came up with a new product, which was called Sprite Cherry. Okay, in India, it is very rarely available. So this is a cherry. Now, how they came up with this project, this particular flavor, or this particular product, is the case study of AI and machine learning. So what they did when they have uh, kept the self vending machine for mix and match and bring uh, making their own soda drink, that was the time when the Sprite Cherry, uh, when uh, they uh, collected the data from all these vending machines and they found the people who are coming to the self vending machine and mixing and matching and making flavors they collected and gathered the data and they found what is the usual and the common mix which the people are liking. And they are coming back again and making the same kind of a mixture of two Coke or two, uh, two basically two flavors. And they started using those data and there was a huge chunk of data which they got. This particular data, what they did, uh, they used this data, like for example, they found that People like mixing strawberry, grape, peach, and raspberry or orange or vanilla together and come out with something. Like they want to mix with a soda drink uh, like Coke with some food drinks, strawberry, grape, or all these kinds. So what they did, they basically used this data, created an AI model, they gave it to the company. And one particular company gave it this particular data was the uh, you know uh, the thing which what they did with this data and the company is called Nielsen Data Company Analytic Company. The Nielsen Data Analytic Company used this data of the people who are mixing and what are the common mix or the common flavor the people are liking. With this data, they could analyze and come out with a new product called Cherry Sprite. And this Cherry Sprite was actually the mixture of soda drink like Coke plus the fruit drink and it had the amount of sugar which could be there that also was determined by the soda so the entire cherry sprite drink was actually made with the help of ai the analytics uh, ai sorry algorithm and with that they announced this cherry sprite cherry which became a big hit among the people who were mixing and matching and they really like this particular kind of a sort of thing. So today when a company is coming out with a new product, especially a product company, just a minute. Yeah. Okay, sorry, there's some construction work going on in, in the office and because of that, a lot of noise. So not uh, this is one of the examples, students, that how a particular company are using AI to come up with the new product from the customer data which they obtain. So the customer data, like how Coke has analyzed from the self-vending machine with a mix and match style, that what is the taste or the flavor the student, uh, the customer liked the most. And they came out and they were really successful because no company want to invest in R&D and come out with a proje uh, project with a speculation whether it is going to work or not. So this is one example. Next example I can take you through is the best example, which is of McDonald's. 
how McDonald has used AI uh, for their sales strategies. So McDonald, you know that they have the franchisee model and uh, it is all over the world. And uh, in all over the world, they basically try to uh, have the uniform taste of all their burgers and all. But at the same time, they also try to match the uh, menu with the uh, kind of uh, the culture or the perception of the customers in that particular country. Like, for example, in, in India, when they started the beef burger, people uh, objected and uh, there were a lot of, uh, you know, McDonald's stores which were closed. So immediately they came out with thing and they found that in India, people are vegetarian, most of the people and they like. So they came out with a new flavor for Indian market called Alu Tiki. So they have come out with, uh, they used AI. How they used AI? The first example of the AI was drive-through chain. One of the biggest collaboration between the McDonald and artificial is witnessed through this drive-through chain. Now in India also, you might have seen that you can just drive through and you can just stop your car and you can pick up and you can go. So McDonald didn't have this kind of a drive through restaurant earlier, which can actually, you know, help the customers who is just driving and passing by the McDonald and he just want to pick up and go. He doesn't want to get down, sit or go order, take away and all. So drive throughs are basically built separately along with the McDonald food joints. Uh, there will be a food joint and there will be a uh, you know drive through also that help the staff worker uh, for the with the takeaway orders okay so those who wish to take away their order and get different uh, packaging on the kind counter of ai uh, mcdonald's uh, drive through they can use this so this particular this particular idea of having a drive through restaurant was, uh, you know, uh, uh, McDonald was the first one to do that. And how they came up with this idea? Actually, they were working to come out with a particular trail strategy, good marketing strategy. And they collaborated with IBM to uh, come out with a strategy which can give them the maximum lean. And AI used the data, whatever they had, and also other data and analyzed that uh, the kinds of customers which McDonald was, uh, is getting. And there is a set of customers who are in hurry, who are in car, they don't want to get down and all. So they did a study on the McDonald food chain uh, across the IBM did that particular software for them. Uh, they are automating this and they only gave this idea of drive through chain. And they got all these data. From all these data, they could understand, they did a research on the market and they could understand that how they can reduce the time of delivery and make the person take the delivery only. And sometimes it may happen in certain countries that you have an app, you are you just uh, you know order it and while uh, passing and you just take the order, you don't have to get down, you just drive through the lane uh, on the drive through restaurant, pick up the order and you go. And so that is something which is really paving and uh, AI uh, is doing that in some of the McDonald's restaurants, you have robots also serving. So this has actually helped in increasing 85% of their sales, right? The second example of use of AI is predictable purchase. Predictable purchase is the second application of this non-tech industry, which is in food joint. Actually speaking, students today, every company is a digital company because every company use data and every company use anal analyze the data and come out with the strategies. So what happened? The McDonald automated their ordering system and also used the AI to predict the purchase order. Like for example, how much you will stock a particular item which will be in demand in a particular area where a McDonald particular restaurant is serving. So in order to predict the purchase order for a particular area and keeping the stock of that, they use the artificial intelligence algorithm. And from the past historical data, uh, they did a forecasting or prediction. Last class, if you remember, I was talking about predictive analytics. They predict the trend and which helped the McDonald's staff, the human being, to prepare the most wanted and most desired item in a big stock. So that, like for example, burgers or maybe fries type. Not only this, they can also identify the best combo 
you know that when you go to McDonald's, you get combos. And most of the people like com combos. So they tried to find out the combination of the combo. So what they did, they gathered the data, the purchase data, and that data has been put into machine algorithm, uh, you know, AI algorithm to understand that in the combo, in the kit combos, you have toys and all. So they tried to understand which toy is more desirable for a particular kid. And because of that toy, the kid will bring the parents to the McDonald's and make them buy that combo because they're getting that toy. That is one thing. Secondly, is that which of the combo, the combination of the drink, the combination of the burger and the fries, which is uh, most popular and a person who has ordered for a particular combo, uh, will he order the same combo or would he like a suggestion in that combo in the next order? So what they do is they create, they have a database of the customers who are ordering, who have the same taste or who order the same kind of a combo. And then through that data, they analyze that if the customer diveate, some of the customer who have the same category of the taste, if they diveate and they add certain other thing or they suggest, they take that and basically suggest that to the other person who is ordering that particular combo. So AI and machine learning algorithm together So AI and machine learning algorithm basically together combined does a prediction. And this prediction is helping the a McDonald's store to come out with the most demand, uh, you know, uh, product or the menu. And they don't have a situation in any of the McDonald's stores where the stock is over, uh, the stock is overstock and they don't have a sale of those stocks. So they will stock only those items and create the item on the menu based on the prediction. And that is because of the AI. And again, IBM is helping. One more example, very interesting, which I found I want to tell you, is the plan of the collaboration between Google and Roy Royce, uh, Rolls Royce, sorry, to create an autonomous and smart, smart ship. So what they're doing is they're using the machine learning algorithm to come out with a, which is on Google Cloud. You know, I'm going to talk about the cloud computing now. And they're making a smarter and autonomous. We have heard about autonomous car, driverless car, but now making an autonomous ship, that is something which, uh, you know, is amazing and which is really surprising. So AI algorithm are basically used here in to train using a machine learning to identify an object which can be encountered at the sea. It can be a sea animal or it can be a fish. And once it identifies, it classifies them based on the hazard they may pose. For example, when a ship is moving in the sea, if there is a whale or if there is a rock, suppose a big uh, you know, iceberg or something like that, from a distance, like an autonomous car, the, uh, the sensor can detect the uh, thing and it can capture the image the image goes to the machine learning or ai the algorithm will uh, understand and classify what kind of hazard is it is it good and the machine learning algorithm uh, which is used by google voice and image searching application is also used here they use this data set the input from the sensors the cameras on the vessels just like uh, the autonomous car and all these input goes on through the internet goes on the cloud based uh, the cloud based, uh, the, in the cloud, you have an AI application, related application. Entire data is then shared by the ship on the, uh, to this cloud, the Google cloud, right? Uh, and the machine learning engine. And these uh, basically try to classify the object. The software also try to detect and identify any track, any surface object. It try to make the vessel safer, more efficient, automatically uh, change the route if there is any hazardous or uh, even predict the weather and accordingly it basically uh, automate the entire shipping. So you don't require a manual expertise or a human expertise here to understand whether the ship can be moved into certain direction if there is a hazard or if there is a weather prediction which, doesn't, uh, which will let a danger for or which will indicate a danger for a ship 
it is all indicated through AI today. And with for this, the input comes from sensors and camera. So Google Cloud machine learning engines use neural net based neural network machine intelligence software. Neural networks of software are the domain of AI, which helps in processing the image and identifying a pattern in that. And through that pattern, it can classify. For example, if I remember, I told you in the first class that if you look at the, uh, for human being to look at the cat and dog, uh, both looks similar except for the size. Both have the four legs and everything if you want to classify. But you can still make out and say, this is cat, this is dog. But for a machine, a AI machine to have those image and identify which is cat and dog, they need to have certain unique feature and they need to identify a unique variation in these two uh, animals. And that is how the pattern is recognized and the classification is done. So the Royal Royce and the Google Cloud software created a machine learning model which can interpret large and diverse marine data sets which was actually collected through the sensors and the camera in the entire ship. What this machine learning algorithm was doing, it has a prediction model, which will evaluate the uh, on the basis of application on cloud and uh, which will evaluate the condition surrounding the ship uh, along with the destination it has to reach. And accordingly, it will manage the ship, just like a human uh, you know, uh, person or human expertise. So this is the project of Google and Royal Rose. Now we will look into one of the particular concept and uh, this concept is about the um, cloud computing concept. So students, you might have heard about because uh, some of you have taken cloud computing. So I'll just touch upon this. So cloud computing, you all know that it is basically storing anything on uh, the servers which are connected on a network. So servers which are connected, which can transfer or my, we can, which can store your information there are so many things you can do i will uh, do an application of that so these are the top cloud computing platform all of you know that aws google uh, or microsoft azure uh, hadoop salesforce so i'll show you the demo of salesforce uh, in our day-to-day -day life we use cloud computing like email your gmail is a cloud computing platform your social networking site your whatsapp uh, your zoom classes like how we are using this is also cloud computing platform um, then your virtual offices. So, so many applications we are So this is how we are using it. Uh, so let us look into different kinds. You might have heard about it. I'll just brush through it that you have different kinds of clouds in the, uh, you know, company like private, public and uh, hybrid clouds. Uh, these are the deployment model. And uh, then you have uh, you know, the service model, which is SaaS, PaaS, and IS. And you all know that SaaS is basically for all the application programs, the web-based application program, which you run on the, uh, through internet, and anybody can access it, like your Gmail, your Zoom, your Office 365, your social networking sites, or maybe Salesforce, or any application program which you can access online. Uh, using a credential and you are paying sub subscription fees for that, that is SaaS, right? So it is hosted in somebody else's uh, server and you are connecting uh, to that particular application program on that particular server using internet. Uh, PaaS is for software developer like you all, where uh, if you need, for example, Lambda or you need uh, to work on uh, the Python or Java or HTML, whatever language or whatever software tool you want to use to develop one application, you need to have that particular tool with, within your computer. Now, today it is not possible that you can have all tools. Even the IT companies, what they do is they give, a, they give the credential. They buy the subscription for their software developer on AWS, Amazon Web Service, and give the software engineers these access. And the software engineer course use a particular platform and develop the software right so you can use that i'll show you the aws and the various features of that just a little bit of that so the common one which you should know and then is is where you can actually hire a virtual machine of a specific configuration so for example if you are working on a suppose you are working on a very hi-fi 
uh, gaming app you are developing that and you are using uh, you want to use uh, iot or you want to use let's say um, the uh, uh, augmented reality or virtual reality or robotic so you require a high configured capability capable machine now either there is a choice that you buy that or what you can do is you can hire it if you are hiring it it doesn't mean that physically you need to have that machine in your possession that means you can go to aws and you can just go ahead and hire the machine at any cost that is called virtualization through hypervisor you can just convert one server into a particular computer dedicated to like how i for example we are doing the zoom class i can allow one of you to access my computer using any desk so using any desk i can allow that person to access the application program on my computer but that is not all what is 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 allow you to even access my the hardware of my computer okay So what happens is that you can have a virtual machine dedicated to you. It can be a Mac. It you can have uh, any operating system, Linux, Unix, or you can have Mac or uh, server operating system. You can configure a CPU. You can configure a RAM size, and you can take any kind of you can configure a machine, and you can that machine can be dedicated to you and given to you. So those are called those is the IES. So many IT companies, non IT companies. don't buy is machine what they do is they give a account in aws or microsoft azure to their uh, you know developers and ask them to use configure and hire a virtual machine so through your computer a normal laptop you can connect to a higher end machine virtually and work on it so i think i hope you have all understood it so this is how the uh deployment model happens in the service model of the cloud computing is very example uh, very important so software as a service as i said that any application program it can be a enterprises application program which you can run on somebody's cloud uh, you can host your entire application erp program on uh, aws cloud and it will be secure safe available reliable everything will be there uh, and you pay for or whatever space you are taking for like you know hosting your application program or what else you can do is you can access a application program on subscription like ott platform is also can be the example of saas okay and the next one is infrastructure which i told you that you can access a virtual computer of any configuration using your own computer on a cloud platform okay platform as service are for developers who can use any tool python hadoop uh you know uh, iot platform or blockchain or you can say any 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 kind of tool uh, you can use on aws and develop your app as whatever you are using or paying for that so it has a pay as you go model i'll show you that okay so now uh these are the various kinds every company has their cloud computing is today a very uh, highly you know revenue generation uh, business for any company uh, amazon maximum revenue comes from a AWS then you have Microsoft Azure then you have uh, Google cloud computing platform IBM cloud computing platform apart from that there are n number of small vendors or IT companies surviving in Bangalore or any of the cities who are providing the cloud computing services to small small educational institutes small businesses where they can give you a space in their server uh, to hold your data uh the cloud computing data your uh, hold your uh, you know application program uh, they can host it they can allow the access to that uh, they will provide full security to it uh, they can also allow you to access certain uh, powerful virtual computers using that or if you are it company they can allow the it software developers to access certain platform developing platform like i told you using the aws or any of the platform so one of the example which i want to show for the saas is the aws uh, sorry uh, salesforce.com salesforce.com is a 
uh, you know, a very big company who is in the top company in the terms of managing CRM, customer relationship management. So this is one of the biggest company in the world. They have biggest client and they help you in. So anybody can go to the Salesforce one uh, month free trial period is there. You can create account using Gmail or anything and or you can just create an account in, and it goes to the dashboard like this where you can upload your customer database. You can keep a tab on your customers. You can send them updates. You can send them promotional offers. You can create a campaign, marketing campaign. You can track your marketing campaign, get a report from salesforce.com. This is one of the best SaaS or application program available on subscription basis on the internet. And many companies are using it. Even your, you have a business, you can go to SaaS and you can entirely manage the customer acquisition and retention through SaaS, through salesforce.com. So this is one example. So I'll just show you a video. on that. Business is changing fast. In this digital age, everyone and everything is connected, transforming the way we interact with our customers. Salesforce makes easy to use cloud-based business applications that help you stay connected to your customers, prospects, partners, and more. It's the world's number one CRM platform, enabling businesses to sell, service, and market like never before. Four. And it's the customer success platform, helping you to connect to your customers in a whole new way. With Sales Cloud, you'll always have the information you need to close deals, collaborate and sell as a team, manage contacts and track opportunities from first contact to final handshake. Service Cloud allows you to deliver a world-class customer service experience, track customer activity across every channel from online to on the line increase agent productivity and resolve issues fast to keep customers truly satisfied. With Marketing Cloud, you can create personalized one-to-one -one customer journeys and powerful multi-channel marketing campaigns that generate leads and drive sales. And with Community Cloud, you can build vibrant, engaging communities that help customers, partners, and employees help themselves and each other. Make quicker, smarter decisions with Analytics Cloud. Turn big data into a big advantage by uncovering new insights and taking action instantly from any device. With AppCloud, you can build modern employee and customer facing apps that engage and excite, all within a secure, trusted and instantly mobile environment. And now with IoT Cloud, you can connect all your data from the Internet of Things to the rest of Salesforce for better insights and real time customer actions. And because Salesforce is cloud-based, all your information is up to date in real time and available wherever you are. So you can even run your entire business from your phone. This is the world's leading enterprise cloud ecosystem. This is the customer success platform. This is Salesforce. So that is the SaaS platform, the CRM one example. IES platform uh, is basically used, I will show you in the end, that how in the Amazon Web Services, how you can go ahead and you can create. So one of the, some of the major, uh, you know, services on Amazon Web Service, uh, students, I may suggest you people that those who are interested, even those who have not taken the course, still can go ahead and do a course uh, on uh, which is available online free uh, on Amazon itself on AWS also it is available and this is called Amazon Web Certified Professional Cloud Computing Professional and these are not so very technical and if you do this course there is a test which is conducted by Amazon uh, and it charges you around six thousand rupees for per test and if you clear that test you become a certified Amazon Web uh, you know Cloud Computing Professional and you have a huge job opportunity. You can even get a good job in Amazon. So Amazon Web Services have a lot of services. Uh, they have the EC2, which is Elastic Cloud. The Elastic Cloud is the uh, place where you can hire a virtual machine and which you can access through your laptop or your normal desktop from anywhere. So you can create a high configure uh, machine, you know, a machine which you can use 
for developing any application or using or developing game, anything for the time you're using, you're paying for that much. So Amazon EC2, uh, you know, you can just go and create a free tire account. Amazon give you access for one year free. And uh, I will just show you once the session uh, in the end of the session, uh, but you have to give your credit card detail. Uh, they will hold one dollar rupees for one year. And before the completing of one year, they identify, they send you an alert or email saying that if you want to continue. Now, what happens, whatever services you are using, after that one year, they start charging you, okay? There are not all services which are free. So Amazon EC2 Cloud is most, Elastic Cloud is most widely used. Then you have the Amazon S3. Amazon S3 is the simple storage services where you can store your entire database. You can migrate your database from your computer or from your server to the, and have a backup on the say, S3. Not only it will encrypt the data, it will give full security to your data. And it will give accessibility to all the people who have this. The Amazon uh, you know, virtual private network, you can create through, if you want to create a virtual private network and give it to your employee for secure uh, communication or secure transfer of data that you can do. You have load balancing when your server is really very, like for example, e-commerce companies, when there is a big billion day sale, the servers become very busy. The traffic is double, triple. At that time, they have to hire the Amazon Web Service load balancer to balance the load. Because if the load is, the traffic is too high, the service will get interrupted and there will be a denial of services. That's the reason, if you remember in the cybersecurity, I told about that. So they have, they can, you can hire that you can manage your entire relation database using the Amazon Web Service. So we'll look into that later. So let's see a video on Amazon Web Service that how it is helpful and how each one of you should learn Amazon Web Service because students, let me tell you, this is a skill which is needed today in the industry. And this is the industry uh, you know, oriented skill which you need to have even if you are doing uh, any uh, course uh, if you don't know what is happening in the industry and what are the tools used by the industry, you will never be able to work in the industry well. Uh, so it is knowledge is everything. We are all knowledge workers. The more knowledge we have, better it is for us. So just look into it and pay attention. AWS is the world's most comprehensive and broadly adopted cloud platform. Millions of customers trust AWS to power their infrastructure and applications. Organizations of every type and size are using AWS to lower costs, become more agile, and innovate faster. AWS provides on-demand delivery of technology services via the internet with pay-as-you-go pricing. You can use these services to build and run virtually any type of application without upfront costs or ongoing commitments. You only pay for what you use. AWS gives you more services and more features within those services than any other cloud provider. This makes it faster, easier, and more cost-effective to move your existing applications to the cloud and to build anything you can imagine. From infrastructure technologies like compute, storage, and databases, to emerging technologies such as machine learning and artificial intelligence, data lakes, and analytics, and internet of things. Building on AWS means you can choose the right tool for the job. For example, AWS offers the widest variety of databases that are purpose-built for different types of applications. With AWS, you can leverage the latest technologies to experiment and innovate more quickly. We are continually accelerating our pace of innovation to invent entirely new technologies you can use to transform your business. Like pioneering the serverless computing space, with the launch of AWS Lambda, which lets developers run their code without provisioning or managing servers. And AWS built Amazon SageMaker, a fully managed machine learning service that empowers everyday developers and scientists to use machine learning without any previous experience. We are constantly expanding our global network of AWS regions, so you can access AWS services to build and run your applications from anywhere in the world. Each of these regions has multiple availability zones that are physically separated from each other, 
and connected by low latency. High okay, so I'll just show you later because we have less time now. We started late. So next technology we're going to talk about is IoT, Internet of Thing. You all might be knowing that IoT is something like any object, physical object, which can interact with any other object and try to share the information. For example, if I have this pen in front of me and this is a, a you know glass case, uh, this is simple uh, you know um, object which cannot do anything about transferring the data. But if I insert a sensor in this in the pen and both this the case and the pen can take the data and communicate with each other and it becomes an internet of things. So physical devices which can connect and share information with the help of internet is called IoT. This was a term which was actually proposed by one of the MIT researcher, Kevin Aston in 1999. And then from MIT, this concept emerged and today we are surrounded by uh, you know, IoT. Let's look into the example of IoT in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, we use IoT a lot in home automation. Today we have smart homes. In the smart homes, you can switch on the light, uh, you can control the electronic devices, you can control your music system through Alexa, you can draw the curtain through Alexa, you can do anything, actually speaking, using a, uh, you know, what you call the, uh, uh, the sensors or IoTs. So IoTs can convert your house into a smart home where you can reduce the electrical consumption. So when you step into the house, uh, I'd step into the room, then only the light will light up. And when you step out, the, when nobody is there, it will not. Even the AC will work according sense. It will sense the number of people in the room and then work. So that is the home automation. Variable devices, students, you all are wearing Fitbit or iWatch or any kind of a variable devices which can track your heartbeat, which can track your temperature of your body, which can track the heartbeat of your body, which can track the number of steps, number of calorie burn. So all these, uh, you know, variable devices are using IoT. And this IoT are uh, uh, basically the combination of cloud computing sensors and all that we're going to discuss the components. In disaster management, IoT actually help in prediction and the management of natural disaster. For example, take the case of forest fire. So you might have heard in a lot of time in the news that there's a lot of chaos and destruction caused by forest fires. So what in certain countries like in uh, Australia, what they're doing is they are, have a sensors which can be installed around the boundaries of the forest. These sensor continuously monitor the temperature and the carbon content in the region. And these reports are continuously sent to a monitoring hub which can be a room where you have all these, uh, you know, uh, report coming to a computer. And in case if there is an alert that the temperature is rising or carbon content, which can cause a fire, there is an alert which comes through the control room or police station or fire brigade. And they can act swiftly and control the fire where before it is too damaging. Other example are, uh, the smart car, the autonomous car, which use basically the um, uh, AI as well as the uh, sensors and the camera to basically work uh, with the, uh, to work autonomously without a driver. Uh, and also the vehicle to vehicle, uh, you know, uh, vehicle to infrastructure is like, uh, if you're on the app, uh, you can have in the mobile phone and you can track your car you can find out the shortest route, all those kinds. You can find out the empty parking spot. Uh, vehicle to vehicle is a smart car, like on companies, Honda and all those companies have come up with a connected car. And these connected car can communicate with each other and find out that if there is any, uh, you know, what are the uh, distance between two cars. So the sensors can tell many, many things. So high-end cars have all kinds of IoT devices nowadays. In farming also, we are using the IoT devices. If you remember, I told you uh, that how do we do the precision farming where we can embed a sensor in the soil beside the root and identify the nitrogen, phosphorus and the moisture level. And the AI can then uh, guide the farmer to accordingly do the farming, to target the, uh, you know, what you call the, the uh, irrigation, target the fertilization, pesticides. Shopping malls are using sensors and IoTs basically to track their inventory. Uh, the manufacturing industries are basically using the IoT 
uh, you know, to wrap, to package, to automate their entire processing. For example, if you take an example of cold ring manufacturing industry, uh, the manufacturing machine and the conveyor belts are required to interconnect and share some information, status, and data. So this interconnection is uh, happening with the help of IoT. And the status of this manufacturing product, that how many is product produced, like if this is a bottling plant, you can see. And then it once it is packaged, if it is packaged, it goes to the uh, conveyor belt. How many have gone to the conveyor belt? So sensors can manage the speed. They can automate the entire assembly line production. Okay, So that's how the smart manufacturing is happening nowadays with the help of IoT. What are the components of IoT? IoT basically, like a computer, have two major components, hardware and software. In hardware, basically, it is computers and sensors, right? Sensor can be any time. For example, in the watch, you have heart rate sensor, you have temperature sensor, you have so many kind of other sensors. Uh, the software can be one operating system which is needed to interface with the hardware and have an application, specific application program to, uh, you know, work on this. And all these data which is collected, IoT, the sensors are just an input device. They collect all the data and then this raw data is sent through internet on the cloud. So on the cloud platform, you have an application program related to that particular uh, function. And that data goes to that application program. The application program analyzes those data and process those data and the outcome is sent to the device or whatever variable device or whatever device you are wearing or maybe it's some on a monitor for controlling purpose so this is a seven layer osi model of iot this is iot system is based on open system interconnection which is called osi model uh, it is, was introduced by iso you all know international organization for standardization uh, there are seven layer physical layer uh, data link layer then you have network layer you have transportation session layer then you have the presentation and application layer. Then you have a, so each of these layer provides service to the layer of the stack in the, in the stack. So all these are interconnected. So this is how the uh, components can communicate over the database network. And IoT architect is divided into subsystems. Uh, as I said that there is a physical layer, communication layer and application layer and network layer. So the hardware, communicate with the sensors, uh, the hardware are sensors only, an actuator or maybe anything. And then it collects the data. The second layer is the communication or network layer, which take the data and transfer the data from the hardware to the application. And from this, so the physical layers are all hardware, all sensors. And then the network take all these data from the uh, hardware, which are collected and transport it to the application, which is on the cloud. And then how this is how the application program will run those data, analyze and bring come out with the outcome or output. So this is how the physical layer and the application layer is interconnected through the communication layer, which is internet. That's the reason it's called internet of thing. So hardwares are on sensors. Uh, and then you have the device which uh, has app and through this app, you can get the analysis and the outcome, okay? network uh, is required to connect uh, so basically this is the kind of a uh, architect which we use in iot now when we are talking about the iot components as i already told you that physical devices are the sensors which can collect and uh, record the data like for example in the uh, in the case of manufacturing you have pressure sensor you have temperature sensors you have counting sensors uh, you have digi sensors, uh, proximity sensors, different kinds of sensors are available, right? Uh, uh, and uh, that uh, particular center is sensors will collect the data directly from the device. Then you have monitors, uh, the computer monitors. Uh, these computer monitors like tablets, cell phone, computers, all these interface with the application program, which is uh, hosted on the cloud. Uh, and these are connected to network devices like routers or switchers, all these kinds. These are the routers which connect uh, the hardware to the application programs. And the application program layer is basically on the cloud. On the cloud. 
so this particular application program help in monitoring uh, data processing, like for example, in smart traffic management or maybe healthcare devices. So this is how this uh, entire thing works, okay? Everything is interconnected in the Internet of Thing. So Internet of Thing is basically making our business move to Industry 4.0 where everything, all physical device connects to the computer and can receive and send information and help in kind of like analog to digital conversion, data collection. It can help in doing a real-time monitoring. It can help in doing the storage, processing of data, analyzing of the data, and also doing the analytics for taking a better decision, better strategy. So any device which uh, can connect and transfer the data in IoT environment, uh, in IoT in healthcare, we help nowadays, IoTs are widely used in the healthcare, which is one of the major industry which has adopted IoT. Healthcare is using IoT to enhance the patient quality of life, uh, which can improve the safety and security. For example, the patients of dementia or the patient who uh, require the continuous, you know, uh, what you call uh, monitoring. So you cannot have staff monitoring them. It is not possible. So you can have sensors so that whenever the patient get down from the bed or is not there on the bed for a long time, it sends an alert to the nursing station. And the nursing station, nursing people can come. Uh, the health monitoring system on the elderly patient bed is kept where it can, uh, the, it can uh, you know, uh, sense the body area and collect the biological data like temperature, heartbeat, uh, various other kinds of, you know, Sometimes the people uh, will have a high heart rate beat on all those kinds or fall detection. All those kinds it can detect and it can send an alert to the nearby doctor and do that. So these sensors and microcontrols are widely used in the uh, companies. So this is an example. You can go to the site if you want and you can check the data, which is emphatica.com slash care. So emphatica is a US-based company and this company basically take care of adult where they don't send anybody to take care. What they do is they help the family member to monitor their elderly people with the help of sensors. So they put the sensor uh, in the form of variable device or maybe in the form of sensors on the walls, on the beds to collect the data and send the information about the movement or about the status of the elderly person uh, to the person and send an alert if it is required for them to come to home and attend. These are all very secure communication. IoT, whatever data they are communicating, the physical devices are communicating the uh, data to the application layer, all are secure. These are all first encrypted and they use a SSL, so secure socket layer. One of the example I want to ex you know, explain you is the day-to-day -day example which we always use is the smartwatch. And the smartwatch has a communication, uh, you know, uh, layer, uh, the wireless internet connection, an application uh, program, which is, for example, iWatch has all the application uh, which are present in the iWatch in the cloud of the i uh, server. And what they do is the i store have all these. I'm sorry, i uh, server, the cloud server has all these application program which interface with the data collected through the iWatch. So I watch basically have sensors to record your heartbeat, record your movement, record track your activities. Apart from that, it has a feature of fall detection. Uh, if you fall with a high impact, uh, you can just set your setting in such a way that it can send a message to a with your GPS location to a person emergency number which you have set up and tell you that this person has fallen in the places and all. It can also alert you if there is a high rate, it has an ECG. So all these are application which works only with the help of IoT sensors. So IoT smartwatch again will have those three uh, you know, components. Application, which is in the cloud server. Suppose if it is iWatch, it's in the iCloud server. And the communication layer, which is internet. And the physical device is this watch, which you wear on the hand uh, in a way that it basically try to get in touch with the heart or your pulse okay and collect the data from the sensor so this is the one of the biggest application of iwatch which is ecg you can record your heartbeat uh, and most of the time it gives you an alert if your heartbeat is very high it keeps on telling so you have to keep your finger on this ground 
and it records your irregularity in your heartbeat and tell you that but it does, it also give you a disclaimer that uh, you have to show to a doctor basically to understand whether there is a possibility of heart attack or not but it has there are a lot of cases which has told that there are a lot of eye watch has saved the life of many people by alerting them about the irregularity in the heartbeat so this is how these iot devices industrial iot system is very very important it is taking uh, moving the industry to 4.0 it is automating the industry you have a lot of companies like chemical processing company power generation company oil and gas factories uh, auto, uh, you know transportation company all of these companies are using iot or robots or ai sensor acuter uh, monitoring devices uh, to automate their uh, you know industry or automate the manufacturing process and come out with something called smart factories so you have robotic arms which are basically monitored so there is no human labor required they can work 24 bar 7 without any fatigue without any complaint you have iot sensors to tell you and alert you uh, iot sensors and these can actually come out with something called predictive maintenance predictive maintenance is a, a kind of a process where it tells in advance whether a particular machine require a maintenance uh, otherwise it will stop working production will hamper and which is going to, uh, you know, cause problem for the business. Which you, uh, so industry, Internet of Thing, uh, gather a lot of data from production line, uh, electrical and energical system from building management, and help in doing the inventory management, help in doing the production uh, on time, improve in production capability and all. So a lot of uh, manufacturing companies are using uh, sensors now to understand uh, or automate their entire processing automate uh, you know production uh, the your sensor can be in the same area or it can be in the same building you can have sensors on the machine and you can monitor the activity of the machine sitting in some other building or in some other way not necessarily you have to be in the factory okay so you have a remote access and monitoring facility of your factory you can automate auto run your factory using iot devices nowadays improve the productivity, safety, and cost. So this is how it is done. Okay. So a lot of, you can manage everything from inventory management to production. This is assembly line. Those are, these are robotic arms. You can monitor this robotic arm uh, in the assembly line, and you can do the production by just sitting in front of the computer, like how I showed you the Da Vinci surgery. So this is one thing which you can do. So um, let us see one example of the smart factory. Welcome to the digital thread. Here you'll see key use cases of how the product's design, build, and life phases are streamlined and interconnected through the marvels of the digital thread and the digital twin. Through this dashboard, you see the environment for product designers of the future will be working in. The product designer has real-time access to every risk and issue that these products are reporting. All can be achieved 100% virtually without wasting a gram of material. This is the operations dashboard of the Smart Factory Control Tower. Smart Factory enables informed decisions at lightning speeds. Here we are going to manufacture our urgent order. The AR enabled work instructions enable the worker to assemble a new product mistake free for the first time in their life without any prior training because they are guided every step along the way. The customer has received their product and is very excited to take them out for a swim. As the customer is racing with their robo duck, the digital twin of this duck will provide real time feedback to the customer. The digital twin helps the customer repair key modules of the RoboDuck before they are broken, rather than after the fact. Along with the digital twin, the digital thread optimizes and enhances all aspects of the product lifecycle, from the product designer to the end customer, continuously improving the design of the future products to come. Okay, so this is one example of one uh, Deloitte factory. Uh, then come out with something, I think one of the uh, industry experts might have told you about that. So I'll not take much time in this. 
I'll talk about the smart city in a very uh, summarized way. So how the smart city, like even the Bangalore is going to proceed toward making a smart city. I don't know when it is. But then the smart city concept is about application of IoT and AI. So how you use IoT technology to interact within the city and outside your home, you know, and smart city include what? The smart city include the smart grid, which is uh, the electrical grid, which can provide and transform electric power to different areas without any interruption. IoT has green application, which can monitor the environment for pollution. It can uh, protect using smart solar panel, weather monitoring, water safety, farming system. So the concept of smart city is adopted worldwide. Many cities around the world have initiatives. Uh, they have used the IoT application in their facilities to make their, you know, this is what I was telling about smart grids and all. You know, these are the applications, smart farming, smart grids, transportation management. So many cities around the world have used the, have converted into smart city. And uh, for example, this is a, uh, you can go to a site if you want, a uh, student, uh, this is a Toronto, uh, Canada site. And this is a uh, transport, uh, you know, division. So it is called, uh, you can go to twotransit.ca and check real time basis. You can check the transportation, uh, you know, the real time tracking of the car, bus route and everything on this site, on the map itself. So this is an initiative. The, is this initiative is also by a particular, you know, so you can track it. These are smart city application where you have sensors on the road, you have speed sensor, you have distance sensor, which can tell you lane sensor, so many things are there, right? So the smart city is an initiative by AI, um, EEE, uh, smart city initiatives, uh, which try to come out with smart municipality or deployment uh, standard. And if that standard is met, then you, your city become a smart city concept, right? So this is the standard which you should have to convert your, so in the smart city, you should have a very, smart traffic management, smart grids, smart health and education, everything should become very well connected. So one of the example of the smart city is Singapore. So when you see Singapore has implemented the IoT throughout its infrastructure, making it one of the top smart city in the world. So Singapore government launched the smart nation vision in 2014 So the initiative include large number of sensors and the camera, which can be deployed. It's an island. You all know that Singapore is a small island and it has the entire island has a, a ecosystem of IoT. So they include different categories of IoT utilization uh, in the urban life, in the transportation, uh, in the health, uh, in the government, in the businesses. So these are the uh, areas where they have uh, you can go to smartnation.government.sg, uh, SG Singapore, and you can see the initiative taken by the Singapore. You can have a virtual tour of Singapore, which is uh, the virtual three dynamic 3D model, uh, which will enable you to look at the public services given by the government, uh, the research agencies, which work with the government to provide a better infrastructure, smart infrastructure, well connected infrastructure. So you can find out everything like where is your bus? Where is if you want to travel through a traffic transportation system, if you're driving your own car, you can find a parking space, you can find on its own, you don't have to just search for it. And you can find the traffic light or traffic congestion, all kinds of reports are actually done and the surveillance, safety, everything is well connected. Okay, so this is how they connect. They have apps, these apps basically uh, connect with the citizens of the Singapore to give them information from time to time about various uh, activities. Like for example, if there's a dig digging happen and the road is closed, it tell about, send the alert to the people who are traveling on those area. It can talk, tell they have connected cars, which can, for example, like this junction, it can tell the car that there is a car which is approaching, there's an emergency car which is approaching. So all these kinds of things are happening in the smart city, okay? so. There is an app, mytransport.sg, 
which can tell the citizens about the traffic congestion, the traffic light and everything. Okay, licensing services, you can, they can monitor that which are the car which has license expired or whatever it is, they monitor everything. So just let's see one. Uh, San Francisco is. Okay, so I'm going to just Fran show you one uh, video on San Francisco. That is also one of the best example of the smart city. San Francisco is one of the most transportation rich cities in the country. But we've got some immense issues and challenges. We've got the great land use, got the great street design, and people are coming and using transit, but it's overwhelmed. At the same time, the people that are driving find it really hard to get around the city. Too many people are getting hit by cars and they're getting killed. We also have a population of our city that can't afford to get around, or they physically are not able to get around. Everybody can benefit from increased mobility reduce travel times and reduce costs. That time in travel is time that people aren't spending with their families or they're not spending at their jobs. In 2000, I had a stroke. This is what uh, put me in the wheelchair. This is my car. This is my baby. I'm not a sit at home type person. I'm out most of the time constantly doing something. No one solution is going to help make our city smarter. We can't focus on one corridor or one street. Our smart city challenge proposal is really one that we think is holistic. We're focusing on smaller pilots across the region, the city, and particular neighborhoods. From an integrated mobility app that can allow you to route, book, and pay, to collision avoidance technology on our largest vehicles, free Wi-Fi in the neighborhoods, improving bike sharing, car sharing, and electric vehicle charging access in the neighborhoods. Having a street with five lanes of traffic is actually not helpful to anybody. We're trying to rebalance our streets for people people who are walking, cycling, taking transit and sharing. So if we can figure out a way to get people around in higher occupant vehicles, you can fill gaps in the transportation network. You can provide services where we're not currently providing services. And we reduce the need for parking, which means we can start converting some of our parking structures into affordable housing. And then we're going to create a community challenge. We're going to invite the neighborhoods to say, I'm ready for this. Neighbors will be able to reconnect with their neighborhood, shop locally, and really help reinvest their local dollars in their neighborhood. My and I both decided to get rid of our cars. We've gotten this big old cargo bike, a little bit of electric motor to help us get up the hills. We've done a real good job of just taking advantage of what our neighborhood and what our city has to offer and how we can just get everywhere we want without a car and do it that way. This city is only 49 square miles. And every time a car goes down, um, you're contaminating your 49 square miles. So you need to get people out of cars and in some clean vehicles. From the day the cable car was invented right here in San Francisco to today when we are hosting 12 companies that are testing. Okay. So I'll just take last uh, the case study. It's a very interesting case study, which I always discuss with my students when I'm teaching IoT. Uh, the Tesla IoT, Tesla car, autonomous car, you all know about Google, Waymo and Tesla. Uh, these auto manufacturing companies are using IOTs, uh, you know, all across the car to uh, the distance IOT, the speed IOT, uh, and they're using AI as a driver. So autonomous car of Tesla or the Google can work without, uh, you know, the driver. They have 18 sensors and camera to look around the entire, uh, you know, uh, ecosystem or the surrounding. So this is a case study which I wanted to discuss with you, which is called Connected Cow. In this case studies, we are going to learn that how farmers in Switzerland and in Australia are using IoT device uh, within the cow stomach compartment to monitor the acidic level, which can help. And this case study is called connected cow. There are two cases in this. So the monitor IoT devices are put into the or inserted into the cow stomach compartment to detect the positive digestive problem. And this sensor can detect the health issue by monitoring their movement by detecting the sign of illness before it can cause damage and they stop giving the or they stop giving the you know damaged milk or say producing milk. So they're using the IoT to improve the cattle production also by understanding the onset of estrus. So how do they do is I will just explain you this. So this is how they have IoT devices even to track in India. They use IoT. Some of the company are using RFID tag basically to track the cows and all. But how they're doing is they have an IoT variable pedometers. And how does it look? It looks like that. So they have a pedometer which is, uh, you know, put on the cow's leg. And this pedometer is uh, made by Fitosi company in Japan. And this is Japanese case uh, in Japan. They do that. And uh, this uh, basically uh, pedometers 
will track the number of steps a particular cow has taken. So the question comes here, students, that do the cow need to take 10,000 steps a day? Is it necessary? We say that if we take more than 5,000 steps in a day, we may reduce weight. And we try to count our steps by using a variable device, which is nothing but IoT device. But the how does it matter that if a cow walk or take 10,000 steps, will it improve the quality of milk it produce or will it improve the quality of the production of the other cow? Now, today, as I said, that every company is a data company. A company like a dairy farm company, which has nothing to do with IIT, is also a data company because they're also connecting, collecting the data using IoT devices to help them in farming. And this particular pedometer or IoT device is helping these uh, Switzerland farmers or dairy farmers to do two things, detect the health issue early and prevent the loss. And the second is if there is any serious illness and all because of that, uh, you know, they do that. They also uh, use the sensor to monitor the tail movement when a cow is pregnant, you know, have conceived. At that time, this tail movement can help in them to understand the labor contraction and give an alert to the cow that the cow is ready to give a birth. Okay. And when the cow is very stressed, uh, you know, they can help the uh, birth related complication using this. The second very important concept is the cow, uh, you know, understanding the accurate detection of estrus. What is estrus? Estrus is a phenomena which is a biological phenomena where we say that uh, the cow produces heat in the body and there is a heating period, and that is the heating period when you measure that's a period when the cow can conceive naturally or by artificial insemination. So most of the uh, these Switzerland cows or Europe, what they do is in the dairy farm, they artificially inseminate the cow to give, uh, you know, uh, birth to the quality oriented, uh, you know, calf. So they have to understand this esterous period within the 21 days, after 21 days it comes, when the cow body is heated up, it's called heating period. And this eating period, so how it works, so they have to, and this is the eating period of the steerous period when the conception uh, rate of the cow is very, very high. So the hysterious detection normally manually is 55% by just measuring the temperature of the body but with the help of any physical devices. But now, because of the pedometers uh, and the pregnancy rate, because you detect through the, uh, which is not very accurate using a manual device, the pregnancy rate, success rate is 39. Now, because of the pedometer, the estrus detection rate accuracy has increased to 95%, from 55 to 95. And the pregnancy rate has in increased to 67%. So there's a 70% improvement in identifying the right time. So as I said, the estrus lasts only for uh, 10 to 14 days. And it occurs mostly the... There's a time period also, 10 p.m. to 8 a.m., uh, you know. So uh, what happens, how it works? So Fitsui is a company who make these pedometers. The pedometers collect the steps, number of steps the cow has walked. And uh, there is an antenna which is installed, which receives this data. And the receiver through the internet or the router they connect. It goes to a cloud computing through it, internet. In the cloud center, there is an application which is hosted. This hosted application program work on that data and send the communication to the farmer's mobile phone about all things. So the information may come like this. This is a normal period when the cow is not heated. Now there is non estrus period. The movement of the cow will be like this. But during the estrus period, the movement of the cow will become very high. The cow will walk long. So that means to say that if the cow is walking a lot, and taking 10,000 steps in a day, that's the time when they have a hysteresis period activated. And that's the best time for conservation. So start of the hysteresis detection. So 16 hours is the time period in which from the start date of hysteresis, when the cow moment, the cow step moment becomes 10,000 in a day. That's a day when they understand that cow body is heated and it is the best time for conceiving. So what they do is they basically 
the 16 hours is left from the time of detection of hysteresis where they can do the artificial insemination. And when they do the artificial insemination, also the company has told them from the data that if within the four hours, if they do the of starting of the hysteresis, if they do the detection, there is a probability, high chance of getting a female and high chance. So depending on what they want, a cow or an ox or whatever it is, they basically try to inseminate. Okay. So you can go ahead and watch a video on connected cow. It is on YouTube. Uh, student, this is one of the best case studies, which is discussed even in MIT and Harvard or IAMS, where they tell the students about IoT with this example. So here I'm going to stop my uh, session today. Just give me a few moments. If there are any question, I can take that. Because you people never ask questions. Yeah, is there any question? Anybody? Yeah. You can write in the chat box if you don't want to speak or if you're muted. You can just put some question on the chat box. Okay, then, Harinakshi, ma'am, I'll wind off now. Okay. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. So, students, I have given you some project. Start working on those coding. And any team which is ready, uh, Arinakshi, ma'am, can you just want, uh, you know uh, get in touch with these uh, with Nisha, ma'am, and get me the uh, you know allocation of the project? I have given um, the project, and if I can get that, I can uh, track them. So most probably uh, after January, when their exams are over, I would like to actually see the project done. So let them okay. start working now because when their exams are approaching, they'll be more focusing on exam. Yes, okay, if, and if there is a confusion, they can ask me in the session during the session. Okay, ma'am. Oh, okay, ma'am. Thanks, students. Have a nice Thank you, ma'am.